the tasting with some very special guests. We have the owner of Monty Winery in Abruzzo, who's going to give us a tour of the winery. And then we're going to do a tasting through seven wines. The Asian sommeliers. So I'm going to introduce the people that we have on the call with us. We have Rodrigo Redmond. Uh, we also Hello. have Stella Vania from Indonesia. She's a WSET Level 3 certified sommelier and works for a distributor out of Singapore. We also have Mr. Ryan Cheng from Malaysia, a certified sommelier with the Court of Master Sommeliers. We have Mr. Shigeru Ayashi from Japan, who is a journalist, a consultant, and author of numerous wine books. And we have Suntor Lapmul from Thailand, a WSET Level 3 certified sommelier, who previously who works at the um, Mandarin Oriental in Bangkok. And we have Fabien Etienne, who is joining us. Fabien is originally from France, but lives in Malta currently and has his own wine consultancy business. So I'm going to turn it over to Rodrigo, who is outside of the winery in Abruzzo right now. It looks kind of stormy there. <laughs> As I was uh, mentioning earlier on, yes, how you doing, Cedar? Very nice to uh, see you. And uh, welcome to all the guests who are here today and obviously all the uh, very established uh, wine authorities who are participating in this uh, wine tasting uh, seminar and a webinar that we are organizing today. Um, outside, we are more or less in the middle of one of the first uh, thunderstorms we have in our area. And obviously, the concern in these cases always goes to the risk of hail that can definitely do damage uh, during this uh, moment of the year uh, to uh, the flowers. Uh, or the buttons uh, inside the actual grape bunches at the start of the vegetative uh, cycle. Um, right now in the uh, vineyard, obviously the operations that we are uh, doing are predominantly of canopy managing. So we're basically, I would be the person who would be an expert on that, taking care of the haircut of uh, the actual vineyards out there. Uh, but, you know, no risk. We've checked on the, the weather forecast. And obviously, uh, we expect next four or five days to have uh, rainfall of this kind, but um, no risk of hail. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, where I am actually geographically located, because we tend to be far distant uh, away from uh, the Asian continent. And I think the first thing we need to do is to give you a geographic uh, context of where we are. So we are basically in the heart of the Italian peninsula. If you take a look at uh, the, the map of Italy, um, you will see that we are just east of Rome. So right in the middle uh, of uh, the Italian peninsula, but on the east coast facing Asia or uh, facing uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, this is an area um, which actually has been uh, very often cut off uh, from the influence um, of other wine regions. So we consider it to be one of the most authentic wine regions of Italy. In fact, um, if you uh, read uh, and you go Google search uh, the level of biodiversity that this region has, uh, we are the region with the greatest concentration of biodiversity in all of Europe. And the reason for this is that uh, in the um, distance of about 200 kilometers, we have numerous different kinds of soil and altitudes. Uh, you should know that the Italian peninsula is cut by a mountain range called the Apennine Mountain Range, uh, which basically reaches 3,000 feet in height. And it has snow covered throughout the year uh, because we have literally about 20 minutes away the southmost glacier of Europe. So um, it's, um, it's an area which has covered 30% of the whole region in national parks. So if you can imagine, these national parks are considered to be the greenest region of, uh, of Europe. So uh, as far as flora and as far as fauna or as far as animals are concerned, we regularly encounter wolf, we regularly encounter bears, um, and obviously all different kinds of, of game. But probably the riskiest kind of, uh, of species that we have here in the area is the wild boar. And as you know, the wild boar has great tusks and obviously these are very challenging because sometimes they can dig in the roots of the vineyards or as we know the wilder the animal the riper the fruit they enjoy uh, they tend to eat also a lot of grapes and over the course of the years as you can see in the background higher up on top of the hill our region has developed a different kind of training method a different kind of canopy management in abruzzo 
we basically grow the vineyards in two different styles. The very traditional Bordeaux-like, low-trained uh, vineyards, uh, but we also have what we call Pergola Bruzzese, which are these, um, these vineyards which grow all the way two meters in height uh, and basically allow only manual labor. And these have been very useful to prevent any issues, obviously, with uh, well, wild animals. Our estate is about 45 hectares in size, and we work with only indigenous varietals in the area. And those would be mainly Pecorino, Trebbiano, and Montepulciano, which we'll be tasting today. To give you a reference point, uh, Trebbiano sometimes can be compared to a more concentrated Pinot Grigio. Uh, Montepulciano sometimes is a cross between Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah in terms of flavor. Um, and obviously, uh, Pecorino, by many, uh, is compared uh, to Sauvignon Blanc. So these are uh, wonderful varietals, which from a taste profile today are very much enjoyed by the marketplace. Our um, training uh, methods and our viticulture, before I jump into the vineyard tour, just give you one last uh, fact, uh, are obviously made in a sustainable fashion. What that means is uh, that we don't utilize pesticide, pesticides, we don't utilize herbicides, and we try to be as natural as we can with all the different operations we do in the vineyard so that we pollute as little as possible and preserve as long-term as possible uh, our own uh, uh, vineyards and, and grapes. Uh, now I will lead you inside the, the winery and uh, show you a little bit about the high technology that we sometimes utilize in, uh, in wineries. So, buongiorno and benvenuti, as we say in Italian. Uh, excuse me if um, the show will obviously uh, show... Uh, not the greatest of, uh, of details, but we are literally walking on the ground floor of the winery. And uh, we then reach a staircase, which will uh, take us down, basically, to the vinification area, where we have dozens of stainless steel vats for the vinification or fermentation of the actual wine. So I find myself right now, as you can probably see, um, in the middle of the heart and the lungs of our operations. Um, these are stainless steel vats. They all include about 20,000 bottles inside them. Um, and uh, we have about 24 of these because when we make wine, we want to treat every individual parcel in a very unique and a very special way. Because as you know, even if you buy any kind of fruit, um, every uh, period of the year and every variety or type of fruit coming from a different uh, farm will always ripen to a different way. So whenever we bring in the raw material, the raw fruit, the raw grapes into the winery, we want to make sure that the transformation into alcohol or the fermentation obviously is done in the most tailored, in the most personal way. Uh, because we are, after all, an artisanal family-owned winery uh, that operates with the utmost uh, care. Um, you will see uh, behind me uh, some panels uh, on the stainless steel vats. And what these, these are used for is, first of all, temperature control. Uh, and secondly, uh, to basically um, pump over the wine or basically press the cap into uh, the actual wine or, or must. So there is also a little bit of uh, mechanical activity uh, in this artisanal um, production. Uh, we chose stainless steel because at the time when we made the investment uh, back in 2001, um, we, ch we thought that this kind of material was very clean um, and obviously it was also easier to control versus cement or terracotta or other forms of uh, materials that are utilized to create these containers to make the fermentation or the transformation of, uh, obviously, uh, juice to uh, wine. I will now uh, walk you down to the cellar. And obviously, if there are any questions, feel free to, um, to ask at uh, specific moments when I believe we will provide opportunities for people to, uh, to talk. As you can see, I'm going down two floors down, and this obviously is necessary in order for us to enter into the cellar. And um, you will see that uh, at this moment, here in the 
temperature controlled cellar, um, we predominantly have our single vineyards that are uh, aging. So those will be the uh, more concentrated and more full bodied wines that we will be tasting um, later on during, uh, during this event. Uh, these wines require a longer oak aging. And um, when you look at a barrel, um, in the appearance, like in the cover of a book, um, they will all look the same. Uh, but in fact, they each have their own very precise identity. Um, because every barrel has a unique story, has a unique history to tell. Um, every barrel comes from a different forest. And so has grown over the years in that forest. Um, every um, barrel is made uh, from wood coming from these forests that has basically been se seasoned or dried for different moments. So it could be as little as a couple of years or as much as uh, four years. Then these obviously are cut to different sizes uh, and then they are obviously uh, burnt or uh, smoked to basically different levels of intensity. It's kind of like a spice. Uh, you will add more or less in order to bring out more or less of um, that uh, wooden or, uh, or spicy flavor. Um, and then obviously, every barrel has its own age. And therefore, they all leave their own different imprint. And the secret of any seller, obviously, is always in the hands of the seller master uh, or the winemaker. They only know the capability, the capacity, the potential of every single barrel, which they then blend before releasing the final wine. Rodrigo, can I just ask you a question about your wines? Are those all red wines that you have in the barrels there or do you have white wines as well? Um, we also have uh, some white wine aging in the cellar. Um, at this time, uh, we have only available for seeing the red wines. The white wines actually normally are aged in um, uh, larger uh, French oak barrels and um, so obviously, uh, these are not available in this room, uh, but we do oak also white wines. I have to say one thing though, as I clip on, obviously, um, the, um, bear with me, the, the phone. Um, Italians generally speaking are obviously, Italians generally speaking obviously are people who don't like their wines really um, aged in wood. And uh, the reason for this is we tend to be a little bit of purists. I mean, uh, the comparison we always have is with our French colleagues. And as you know, kind of like neighbors, Italians and French never get along. You know, we have a little bit of a conflictual relationship with uh, our fellow Frenchmen, especially because it was us back 2000 years ago that brought them the vineyards through the ancient Romans. And uh, when France was just the province of the empire, um, but obviously, they claim, obviously, to be, you know, the true, uh, how can I say, original wine producers of the wine industry, which, as everybody knows, is not necessarily the case. Uh, that being said, um, in general, the concept of wine is, um, is very different between Italians and French, because Italians have a more, uh, how can I say, social uh, interpretation of what wine is about. Uh, Italians tend to have the idea that wine is about sharing with family and friends and sort of a, a very chaotic and loud and noisy, no, noisy uh, table. That's the idea of uh, an Italian enjoying wine. When you talk about a, a Frenchman, it's more about luxury and it's more about the fine dining and the ultimate expression that there is um, in, uh, in, uh, in eating at a restaurant. And if you look at the two different styles of cuisine, you will notice that Ita French tend to be more technical in their cuisine and therefore also in their wines to support that food. And Italians tend to be more purists. If you look even at the way they make wines, you will see that Italians tend to be more single varietal oriented. They are purists. They work with one varietal most of the cases. There are some exceptions. French tend to work much more on blends and assemblage, as they call them. And so I think that goes to say more that they are more on the technical rather than on, you know, the fresh fruit, true ripe flavor um, that the grape holds, which is really what Italians are, even their cuisine. If you look at Italian food, you will see that we actually enjoy very much 
being able to taste uh, the single ingredient. And so uh, most dishes that we have in Italy are very quickly prepared, uh, very much like the Asian culture, and very much based on the freshest ingredient possible. Um, so uh, this whole story, just to say that, obviously, we don't really age as much our wines in wood, more for a flavor profile uh, rather than a question of, uh, of quality, because uh, the use of barrel is not necessarily an indication of quality. Quality, uh, in a, uh, at least from our perspective, stems from the work in the vineyard, balance, and integrity in the wine. That for us is the definition, obviously, of what quality is about. So uh, obviously we try to display uh, this in our wines and it's not always possible, uh, but we feel in the short time we've been making wine that uh, uh, we try to come as close as, uh, as we can. Excellent. I do really love Italian wines with food. I think they're amazing. Um, some of the best food pairing wines that you can find out there. And we have a friend who's asking, do you sell your wine in Indonesia? Where can they find this in Indonesia? Um, absolutely. Um, obviously, uh, Indonesia for us is uh, a very important market. Um, there are a lot of Italians that are big fans about uh, Indonesia uh, in general. A lot of uh, uh, you know, surfers that uh, go back year after year. And um, I would say, generally speaking, you would find uh, our, um, our wines predominantly in uh, Jakarta and in Bali. Uh, Bali being obviously the most important market. Uh, generally speaking, we are more on-premise, so you'll find us in the top luxury hotels in, 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 in Indonesia, in, in Bali, and obviously in you know, the top restaurants. That's mainly where we aspire to be. Today with COVID, as we know that the hotels are slowly reopening in, uh, in, in Indonesia, we just spoke to our partners in Indonesia today, um, uh, we obviously will need to also consider more the retail. Uh, because people, for the time being, prefer to stay at home and enjoy a nice bottle of wine. So uh, we need to also see how to uh, basically answer that need that, uh, that they have. Uh, but I have been to Indonesia two, three times. And I can't wait to go back. It's a beautiful country. The people are extremely uh, friendly um, and the weather is great. So I uh, can't wait to go back. Awesome. All right. Are we ready to start tasting? Stella, are you ready? Um, our first wine that we're going to be tasting is the, uh, the Trebi 2018 with Stella Vania. This is the Trebiano d'Abruzzo. Do you have the wine there with you, Stella? Uh, yes. Perfect. Everyone also has the wines. Oh, Sweet. there we go. Yes. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, so, uh, so, Rodrigo, I think... Um, as we've spoken before, like I'm from Indonesia originally, but too bad I didn't get a chance to meet you. So my first encounter with Talamonte wine was like a few can years ago. Uh, can you hear? Hello? Yep, I can hear you. Oh. Okay, I'm not hearing, just okay. so you know. Okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, when was I? Okay, so my first encounter with Talamonte was a few years ago, and since then, I always think that Talamonte is one of the good example for me to show that a good wine doesn't have to come with a high price tag. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's really good, especially with the Trebi. I think it's a very easy to drink. It's very suitable to Asian weather, especially like here in Singapore or back then in Jakarta. I think it's really good and can you tell us a little bit about the flavor profile of the wine so i just opened it like oh. <laughs> okay mm. i think the wine is very refreshing with the tropical fruits and the acidity is not so high but it's just nice to have uh to pair it with some foods so i think it's important the wine has a nice acidity and uh, with a good touch of minerality and fruit, so they can pair with the food well, add with the food well. And actually, Rodrigo, I have questions for you. Uh, regarding the grape, um, this is made of 100% Tebriano de Abruzzo, am I right? Did you hear that, Rodrigo? Are you still not hearing anything? Okay. No, I didn't hear. If you can just summarize and I'll yeah. answer right away. Stella's oh, asking um, if it is made with 100% Trebbiano d'Abruzzo or if it's a blend. 
No, it's definitely 100% uh, Trebbiano d'Abruzzo. Uh, it's obviously a special clone we have. Uh, some people refer it to the Valentini clone. Uh, as you know... Uh, Did we lose you? I, 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 I hear Rodrigo, but now it's... No, he's frozen now. <laughs> okay, we wait. All right, so <laughs> while we're waiting for him to come back, I'm just going to ask you, do you have any specific foods that you would pair with this? Like anything that you like to eat that you would pair this with? Okay, uh, I would love to pair it with chicken rice. Since I'm in Singapore, I always like to pair like a uh, local food and some wines. Mm -hmm. But let's say I saw some fellow Indonesian whose life also... Can you hear me? I think yeah. like Indonesian. Yeah. Stella's talking just for a second. Yeah. Hi, Rodrigo, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Wait. so uh, my question is like, is Trebbiano the Abruzzo is the same with Trebbiano Toscana? Because I think there are few Trebbiano in the market, so. Yeah, so uh, Trebbiano has uh, an extraordinary story, you know. Trebbiano mm -hmm. is a grape variety that um, originated 2,000 years ago. We have an ancient Roman author called Pliny the Young that talked about how Hannibal's troops crossed the Alps when they were attacking ancient Rome and basically rested only five kilometers from the winery drinking this Trebbiano white wine. So this is a grape that's been planted for thousands of years. Wow. Uh, I reconnect myself to that story about the Italians bringing the grape varieties to the French. Well, the Italians basically expanded the Trebbiano grape not only from Abruzzo but all the way up to the central part and northern part of uh, Italy and eventually to France to the Cognac region because Uni Blanc in France is the same grape as Trebbiano. So um, in France, they make cognac, we make wine out of it. And um, uh, the Trebbiano grape is a very versatile grape. There are many different uh, uh, clones of Trebbiano. For example, one is used to produce balsamic vinegar. Uh, one was used in the original recipe of the Chianti uh, Classico uh, wine. They allowed 2% of Trebbiano inside it. So there are many different kinds of Trebbianos, each one with their own characteristic. And this is definitely uh, more minerally and more aromatic. Beautiful. Okay. All right. Um, Have you tasted yours, Rodrigo? How's it today? I did, and actually, it it it, it was um, a, a few weeks. I had not tasted the the Trebbiano. What I like about it is this uh, wonderful freshness and acidity that really calls for a second glass. I think um, uh, Stilla will uh, will agree that um, it's not only balanced, uh, but it really tickles the palate and invites you to basically have a second glass. This is a perfect aperitif wine. You know, I can imagine myself talking about Indonesia you know, sitting on uh, some a Bali, you know, uh, resort, uh, enjoying a great glass of, uh, of Trebbiano as the sun is setting. There would be no better uh, moment uh, or location uh, uh, than something like that. So when are you, um, when are you releasing the 2019 vintage? I see you're still on that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it, it's funny. Uh, the, the, the new vintages are always in great demand by the market and a wine producer is always fighting with uh, the market to hold back the release of the new vintage. The market screams for the new vintage because the market wants the latest release. Uh, but in fact, to reach that balance and that equilibrium, many wines require a little bit of bottle aging, especially for the development of the aromas of the wine. You know, all of us know that uh, the uh, aromatic composition of a wine develops greatly in the bottle. So uh, we have produced the 2019 vintage and we started uh, about two months ago, two, three months ago, shipping obviously the new vintage. Now I suspect in most cases the wine has not been released in the markets because obviously there's a uh, distance that needs to be traveled. Um, but generally speaking, our wines are at their optimal level after six months that they have been bottled. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. I always like to let them sit a bit when they've just got in as well. Just don't open them right away once they've been shipped. Um, all right. So we're going to look at the second wine now. We will be tasting Trabocchetto, which is a pecorino with Mr. Shigeru Hayashi. Okay, here I am. Ah, you have it? Excellent. This one. Yes. Yes, okay. Susan, very nice to see you. Nice to see you. 
Ludovic, you want to explain the, the wine or I can start? Please, 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 please start. Please, allow me. You know allow in Japan, this uh, bottle is very interesting because you know that this bottle has a Japanese sake designed. Oh, okay. Interested. The reason why, uh, the far, uh, one of the reasons, very interested design bottle for Japanese. And second one, second thing is very interesting because it's named Pecorino. Pecorino is a sheep, no? Correct. So Pecorino cheese, they know very well. But why this is the variety of Pecorino? So they are very interested. So uh, this is the second reason. And third reason is naturally. Wine is good, tasted good. You know, the, this wine is very, what can I say, the fruit and the tasty and uh, what can I say, aroma and, uh, and uh, uh, aftertaste, but a little bit bitter. So very good combination with Japanese foods, like a sushi, like a tempura. So um, very uh, uh, interested in uh, uh, Japanese, normally, uh, they want to, to, to taste uh, red wines, but now going to change because you know, naturally low fish and uh, easy uh, Japanese foods must be abinated with white wine. This is good wine for Japanese food, I think. So, and another thing very interesting is name of this wine. Trabocchetto. Um, some years ago, I went to Abruzzo. I stayed Trabocco, Trabocchetto. So I'll show you who uh, uh, don't know the uh, where uh, Trabocco. Okay. Yes. Okay. This is okay. Ludovico, you know very well, no? Yes, yes, wooden construction from the seaside. Design bottle is fishing late, fishing a, a net, you know. So oh, this is the net, and this is a restaurant. So inside and the, uh, of the sea, you can eat uh, the fish, fresh fish, and uh, fried fish with this wine. So, this named Trabocchetto and very interesting. So, uh, this is the reason why this wine is going to wear in Japan. So, very flower and the fruity uh, pear and uh, can I say uh, apple, very, very young one and the taste. some herbs, some fruit, and a little bit, uh, bit uh, bitter as a taste. This is good for, what can I say, uh, clean the, the, the mouth after uh, there's some, some fried meat as a pork, as a, a grilled, uh, grilled chicken, very good. So uh, not only Japanese food, but also uh, fight uh, meat uh, will be very good combination with this wine. And this is uh, 2018. It is uh, why until now very uh, crispy. So this accent is good for uh, abination because you know uh, the the wine must be uh, uh, okay uh, together with it. Uh, uh, to, together with uh, the, the the dinner. So uh, dinner time, we need some uh, some kind of uh, wines, not only tasty but also together with them. So this wine, not 
heavy, not aromatic, not uh, strong, but good balanced wine. So we way we can go with almost all kind of foods, Asian foods especially. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, your, uh, your your description uh, uh, fits perfectly, Hayashi-san. I thank you very much for uh, uh, your kind words. Um, Pecorino, uh, which uh, is in fact a uh, obscure grape variety that was mm -hmm. almost brought back uh, from uh, extinction uh, because yeah. the yields are very low of these grape varieties. And uh, obviously all the farmers in the area uh, historically, we're looking to, you know, make more money and produce more wine. And so, obviously, they uprooted this grape variety, which did not produce sufficient uh, uh, quantity, according to them, uh, and, re and replaced it with more generous uh, varietals. So, Picorino was, was risking about 20, 30 years ago uh, extinction, and a few wineries, uh, including ourselves, uh, decided to uh, experiment and develop a wine with it. So our story is that we first planted Pecorino in 2004, and mm. the first vintage was 2009. So uh, you're tasting a wine that has been made from a vineyard that is about 10 years old, which I think you will agree is a, a level of maturity uh, to bring uh, good complexity. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the first two, three years uh, as People who are watching, obviously, this the seminar will know. Uh, the first two, three years, obviously, there is no fruit that is produced on the on the vine, and then the first crops tend to be uh, maybe of low quantity and a little bit imbalanced characteristics. So people always like to wait seven, eight, ten years before making a, a great bottle of wine. Um, uh, I don't know if you taste. Ayashi-san, uh, the minerality inside the wine, but as you know, because you have been here, most of the area we are located used to be covered uh, under the water, used mm. to be covered by the Adriatic Sea. And uh, obviously we have a lot of limestone in the soil, which you then taste in, uh, in this uh, wonderful glass of uh, the single vineyard that we produce. Okay, one question. Rodovico, one question, uh, can I? Please. Okay. So you have a uh, new uh, uh, DOCG wines. Mm -hmm. Tele Torresi. Terre? Torresi. Torresi. Mm -hmm. Against Ofida. Ofida is the. the for, for Pecorino, you mean? Yes, Pecorino. Yes. yes. The differences. Well, um, uh, Marche it, against uh, Abruzzo, for, for example, we can say. So I think the first thing to understand is 80% um, of the production of this grape variety is made in our region. The remaining 20% mm. is done in a uh, bordering region called uh, Marche. Um, the style of our wines tend to be more on the fresh, pure mm. fruit. I think you yes. taste a lot of passion That's fruit it. inside this wine. Um, the wines from the DOCG tend to be a little bit heavier on the palate. Mm. Uh, they tend to probably be a little bit more Alsatian in style, uh, mm. malolactic, uh, higher in alcohol level, um, a little bit more intense. Um, uh, but, you know, we are at the foot of the tallest mountain of central Italy, the Gran Sasso. Uh, we have a lot of temperature excursion between day and night because we're close to the sea. We're only 20 kilometers away and close to the mountain. So what you really taste is the freshness uh, and the crispiness and the aromatic concentration of this wine, which also comes from obviously the terroir, uh, but also from the winemaking technique because we do two unique things in this wine. Uh, one is obviously uh, the cold maceration that extracts more complexity. And the other is we use hyper-reduction method. So we saturate the environment and don't let the wine obviously oxidize uh, the, uh, uh, even a little bit uh, during the vinification process. So this preserves more primary fruit. It's kind of like when you pick an apple from the tree, there is a lot more powerful smell sure. and concentration than if you leave it on the kitchen table and you have to wait maybe uh, a couple of days and you will see that all those flavors and smells have faded. Well, we see this in the same way. If we use hyper-reduction, we preserve 
this concentration of these wonderful primary flavors. And um, the um, closing off, the, uh, the, the herbs you tasted in the wine, I think uh, what you tasted were the traditional herbs from the mountains we have uh, in the Gran Sasso. So I would say a lot of sage, a lot of uh, rosemary, and some, some herbs. Very, very typical, especially in the evolution of, uh, of the wine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We're gonna move on to the third wine now. Um, we are going to be tasting the Aeternum with Ryan Cheng from Malaysia. And we actually had a friend asking us a question if this wine is available in Malaysia anywhere. Uh, let uh, Ryan maybe answer directly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it is. Um, please, Ryan, let me okay. uh, allow you to talk about this wine and then I'll be happy to interject. Sure, cheers. Ciao, everyone. Thank you. So I got this uh, afternoon. So I, what I have here is a vintage 2015. So I've been drinking a lot of cognac instead, but uh, this is the first dry Trebbiano that I love a lot. And actually only coming from Abruzzo. I have to stress that only coming from Abruzzo, <laughs> no, nowhere else. So this also remind me of all the good memories when I actually uh, visit the winery, which uh, Rodrigo actually showed me the flights of Atenum that actually really surprised me with the uh, the very age worthy and also the strength of this uh, Trebbiano. So you're able to actually create a lot of uh, layers and complexity after aging and even create some buttery notes. It just remind me of like some of the very good uh, Burgundy Chardonnay in a way. Yeah, so let me do the tasting. So we have the color wise with me. It's a, it's a bright gold in colors as you can see. I got the uh, it's about medium and medium high uh, viscosity. In terms of aromas, slight toasty on the front, but I have lots of uh, fresh and also very ripe peach and apricot notes. And also a little bit of uh, the tropical fruit, like a uh, star fruit to me. Mm. Very juicy, they have a medium plus acidity that stay, the wine will come very refreshing. And you see you got a bit of toasty note and uh, a little bit of buttery note that I can really sense it already. The finish is really good because uh, I have a, a very mild acidity with me and also a uh, slightly minerality, a mineral kind of slightly like the uh, rocky kind of uh, minerals. I can really sense that. It's very good uh, purity you can find in, the, in this wine. Great balance. Oh, it's all peach apricot. I get over here slightly uh, ripe apple as well. Mm. This is always a, a, a Trebbiano that I enjoy a lot. Um, to pair with a food, I will suggest something to the local in Malaysia here. There will be a roasted fish. The local fishes like the stingray or actually the mackerel fish that we have over here. Beautiful. Yep. And where would you say that um, wine is? You've got the 2015 there. Where is it in its in its development and its evolution? Uh, I tasted all over the years. So actually, since actually last year, actually it started to change. It started to develop the better and better. And the first, uh, I mean, when I received it about two years ago, it was actually pretty close in the way you have the mineral out front. You have more mineral on the face, mm -hmm. and then uh, it's just more into the citrusy. Um, you have the more acidity in the way, but actually it lack of so so called uh, the apple notes is good. You have green apple notes, but right now actually you find that you have very ripe apple notes, and also you, you are showing some peach and also uh, apricot. So now we have the five years. I think it's still very young. If you still have able to age for another five years easily to me, and uh, I think you just turn better and better. And become a more buttery, oily, which is actually a more complex later on. Lovely. And do you know yeah. in Malaysia where you could buy this if you wanted to? Is it in retail or is it a mostly? Oh. Yeah, actually, uh, we are available in three major cities in West Malaysia, in Johor Bahru, in the south, next to Singapore. And of course, our capital in Kuala Lumpur, and also to the North Island, we have the Penang Islands. We have the distributors over there. 
So you can always contact uh, myself or actually the company is called JJ Suppliers. We have a page on Facebook and you can always uh, contact any of my colleagues. I'll be there to help. No worries. Yeah. Love, lovely. So, Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, pleasure. Always pleasure. Rodrigo, uh, since everyone have questions, so <laughs> I need to have a question with you as well. All right. So this is a great wine to me. Okay. This is a great wine to me. It's always uh, actually a, a very good value white. I love white more than weight. And uh, this wine, I actually uh, very seldom have a very good uh, white uh, age with the uh, barrel. And uh, so this case, that, uh, what is it? I mean, I mean the the technique you use to actually make a, such a good balance of the oak with the with the Trebbiano in this case, yeah. I mean French oak I use. I know it's actually a thirty percent, uh, and the whole the total productions you get into a French oak. But how do you actually reach make it a balance? In, well, not in, over you know, first of all, I think um, there are two um, comments that you made which uh, uh, I took very much note of, and and. I think your whole description on the wine was uh, was very spot on. Uh, the first is you kept on describing the wine with characteristics that uh, des uh, described its purity and its cleanliness. And I think that is the sign of uh, a very good quality uh, wine when it's very clean. And obviously uh, the cleanliness uh, stems from predominantly the ripeness of the fruit. So what I would uh, have to answer to you is as most people know, you know, the majority of the quality of a, in a bottle of wine stems from the fruit, uh, the raw material. And here, I think what we have executed correctly is understanding when is the precise moment that we need to harvest this uh, this grape. I mean, these vineyards are 50 years old. Uh, the ones that we utilize for this wine, they're, they're grown uh, canopy management, pergola trained. Um, and we have four hectares of this uh, unique clone that um, we actually only use one hectare to make this wine. We today make only about 6,000 bottles of this wine uh, a year. So it's uh, something that we make maybe, maybe every three or four years. Uh, so it's something that we release really only when we have the optimal uh, conditions. Um, secondly, what I enjoy that you commented on is uh, the ageability of this wine because there's a general conception today that it's only again i'm going to have to talk about my neighbors french are capable of making white wines that are capable of aging and that have a longevity to the contrary i think and i say this because in this period of my life i'm enjoying white wines in particular you know the the, the enjoyment of, of different styles or kinds of wine really uh, changes over the course of uh, of your life and today i'm enjoying white wines and um, you know, this is a white wine that we can age easily for uh, 10 years in total. There's really no difficulty, no challenge. And again, uh, so the first uh, 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 characteristic is the integrity. This is the most important thing to uh, uh, create a balanced wine. Secondly is obviously the dosage of the wood. And this is more difficult because you know um, that um, when you make a bottle of wine, you taste when you decide how that wine will be, what that wine is tasting like now. And you don't know what it will evolve like over the course of the next 10 years. It's a little bit of a guess. It's kind of like putting that message inside a bottle and throwing it out in the sea. You know when it goes, but you don't know when it's going to come back so, or where it's going to land. So in the yeah. same way, uh, we don't know how the evolution is. We can on the basis of the level of acidity, uh, the level of certain characteristics, estimate um but it's you know it's really a human um it's like a human being that grows um you can guess you can make an educated guess but you only know as you taste over the course of the years what the potential of that child if you want really is yeah all right thank you Rodrigo. we need to move on to the next wine because we have four more to get through um so we're going to taste the rosé next we will be tasting the Rosé 2018 with Mr. Suntuan Lapu Lapu from Thailand. Do you have the wine there with you? Suntuan? Yes, I did. I did here. Um, good evening, everyone from Bangkok. Hi, um, Sarah, and hi, Rodingo. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Um, nice to meet you, and thank you very much. Uh, what I have, uh, as Sarah, Sarah said, I have Rosé. This is uh, Monte Pusciano, the Brusso, right? And uh, it's Rosé, which is very interesting. I have been tasting this wine um, a few weeks ago, which is um, 
um, we're pairing with Thai food, which is a perfect pairing. And what they have today, as you can see, I think the interesting is a uh, it's a color. I used to ask some friend that uh, um, new old world um, rose um, have a dark color, but it's not necessary. But this one is very interesting. The color it's it's beautiful. It's kind of um, um, red rose, which is uh, interesting. And um, what I have on my here it's a lot of freshness. Um, basically, you feel a lot of fruit like cherries, um, cranberry, or even some ripe strawberry. Um, fresh enough and very interesting, which is I feel a little bit of the fresh herbs. Um, if you can feel like this, Rodingo. I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I taste a little bit of mint as well. Maybe that's what you're referring to as, um, as herbs, but the strawberries are very, very clear and the, and the cherries as well. Absolutely. And um, and uh, on my palate, I feeling like um, like a, a basically the majority of components here in the structure. It's it's not a big wine. It's not a kind of uh, you know big um, wine, but it's just exactly balance of the fruit and uh, some acidity. The amount of acidity here on my feeling it's just enough to have some freshness on this wine. And um, candy, you know, some is not sweet, but. This is dried rosé, but but somehow you can feel quite round and acidity of a uh, of the palate, which is which is nice. And also, um, um, how to say it's a little bit complex here to feel probably from the skin of the of the Monte Pichano, right? Um, and last time, um, Shera, last time we pairing with Thai food, and I I recommend to friend um, that should have some. You know, some curry, you know, some yellow curry. We have a lot of curry here, red, mm -hmm. green. We have some some uh, yellow curry. I'd ask them to have not too spicy, you know, but full with the fresh curry on that and put some crab meat on it, you mm. know, fresh crab meat, which is perfect, mm. totally perfect, okay. you know. Mm. And uh, and that that's what um, I think the rosé is not um, popular yet here in Bangkok, but then I think it's coming and uh, and it's kind of, it's not just swimming pool wine, but it's kind of, <laughs> Why? Which is already here in the Michelin star restaurant of fine dining now. What do you think? Yeah. I I think you're 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 um, you know one thing I would like to talk about is is rosé wine in general because uh, rosé wine is in fact uh, the wine which is growing the fastest around the world in terms of increasing in consumption. Even though it's starting from a small base, it's an extremely uh, uh, trendy, hip and very popular right. wine, uh, especially over the last two, three years. And people don't understand that, or maybe don't know yet, uh, because you know the only way to really learn more is aside from attending webinars and reading books is you have to taste and exercise that palate as much as possible. So obviously you need a certain physique to be able to handle all this experience you need to make. Uh, yes. Not necessarily for everybody, but um, <laughs> rosé wine uh, in general has been categorized. People think of rosé wine as, and I don't mean I don't mean to be critical of other producers, but you know the Lancers, the Mateos that people would drink in the seventies. You know this sort of sweet plush style yeah, wine, exactly. but just like white wine, just like red wine, there are many different levels of qualities and styles. And I would like to add that we believe that a darker rosé is actually a rosé of greater quality because mm. um, we know that color comes from the skin, so greater pigmentation, and normally means, uh, first of all, that the wine will last for a longer time, right? It will oxidize less quickly uh, because it has a protective uh, pigment. Um, second of all, that it will have much more concentration inside it. So, mm. you know, people should look at it like a, like a white wine or a red wine. The darker color means that there is, you know, more concentration, more flavor, not necessarily a better wine, but more on the palate for sure. Um, yeah. Also, the, the, the last thing I would like to, to say before moving on is rosé wines are a traditional drink of choice for Italians because everybody mm. has always made their own wine and enjoyed it at home. And in order to do that, they would produce from one harvest for the consumption of the following year, always with very short macerations to be consumed very quickly. So this is really what uh, uh, this wine is for us in Abruzzo. It's a Montepulciano that has been macerated or fermented with skin contact for a short time. So maybe you know yeah. eight hours 
instead of you know the 20 days that maybe we would do for a red wine right and um and now i don't have um question to you rodingo i have to sarah as a woman what do you think when when a man order a glass of rosé <laughs> I think he's the, the the brightest, the brightest person that he could be, and that's the greatest choice that he could make. If the lady in front of him uh, basically enjoys the rosé, because the smartest man is the man who orders the wine that the lady enjoys. There's no aside from a question of gallantry, it's a question of being smart, right? Um, <laughs> I enjoy a lot rosé, and uh, we have a typical mm. dish here in Abruzzo. Uh, yeah. which is uh, arrosticini. <clears throat> there are mutton skewers, uh, so like a shish kebab, that we enjoy specifically with this in the summer uh, because we mm -hmm. don't like a heavy red. We enjoy something more lively and more light. So, uh, you know, I'd recommend great aperitif wine instead of a white wine, for example. Yes, as a, as a sommelier here in, in Asia, uh, especially in, in Thailand, we always keep talking that rosé can be very versatile, can be um, go w everywhere and... Um, Our mentality is still thinking that um, the wine should be red, you know, so the wine should be big white, big red. But here, Rosé is coming. Yes, uh, Sarah, uh, answer my question. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I definitely think when a man orders Rosé, I'm like, okay, there is someone who understands what Rosé is about. Because it's <laughs> right. something that I talk a lot about with clients and Chicago Americans have the perception that rosé is always sweet, which is not the case. And rosé can pair so well with so many different things. I really love it with Thai food. Um, and I'm happy when, you know, when people appreciate what the possibilities are with rosé and are willing to try it and not just assume that it's, you know, a sweet drink that women sit around and drink by themselves all the time. It's, it's great for many, many occasions. Um, That's great. I I hope my friend um, listening this this word. <laughs> I hope so. I'm trying to convince everyone drink more rosé, especially right. When it's it's great. I love it, especially um, the rosé Talamonte, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that color. It's beautiful. Um, we yeah. do need to move on to the red wines now, but thanks very much for tasting the rosé with us. Thank Our you. Uh, our next wine that we're going to taste, we're going back to Stella, who's going to taste the Moda 2018, the Montepulciano d'Abruzzo. Stella, are you there? Yes. Hi, I'm back. Okay, so to support Shadar, I agree that men should bring more rosé. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and now we, I think we've made a point and a statement very clear. Correct. <laughs> so buy more Talamonte rosé, okay? In Indonesia, be patient. You will get the Talamonte wines again. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm having Moda now. Actually, I had for my lunch earlier. I started early, sorry. <laughs> the hours start early. You know, you most of us drinking at home. Um, I had it with fried rice. So it was very good. Uh, the The soft tannin and then the fruitiness of the moda complements the spiciness of the fried rice very well. I mean, when I was in Indonesia, a lot of people asking questions like, what wines is perfect to be paired with fried rice? So fried rice, I think it's like our national food. So Indonesians, your search ends here by moda. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and Rodrigo, I have a question actually. Uh, because you mentioned earlier that you also do uh, Pegora wine training, the one with the roof. Is it Pegora? Pegora, Pegora yes. It's the, okay. the canopy management, so, yes. Is there any um, specific wine variety that you uh, you do Pegora or just? I would say Montepulciano predominantly. And uh, the reason for this is that this is the tradition of um, of the area. Traditionally speaking, The training oh. method was always uh, was always pergola, and I think you taste inside the the, the moda uh, the reason why we do this. Um, we tend to have a very rounded uh, style of Montepulciano. It's not sharp. It's not uh, too aggressive on the on the spicy uh, spice uh. notes. Uh, it actually tends to be very very balanced. Um, and this is coming from two things. One is the uh, 
um, basically a vinification method. We use something called microoxygenation. Uh, but most important of all, this is coming from the very slow ripening we have under the shade of the pergola uh, canopy. Uh, the pergola canopy, uh, which is different from, you know, Guillaume, the French style, uh, tends to have different advantages and disadvantages. One of them being that on very hot vintages, and this with global warming, obviously, is becoming a winning factor more and more. Um, on hot vintages, uh, the grapes actually tend to be protected very much from any kind of sunburnt uh, effects that there could be because of the, of the climate. So you taste a lot of dark fruit, a lot of blue fruit. There's no mm. real jagginess inside this wine. And I think this is uh, stemming from predominantly the pergola uh, training method. And I would like to add that in uh, 20 years of harvests that we have made, um, the pergola has always produced the higher quality uh, of our grapes in terms of the raw material that we end up utilizing. And the only reason we use a combination of both is because obviously we have to hedge somehow and we have to diversify the risk so that if it's a very hot vintage or a very wet vintage, we have at least some crop which survives you know, any possible risk of, of, of issues or problems. So. Um, could we see the bottle label? Stella, do you have the bottle there that you could draw us? I really love that label. Thank you. Thank you. Design. Yeah, very uh, Leonardo da Vinci-like. I think it reminds mm -hmm. us uh, yeah, all of something the, Especially with the sort of geometric diagram and everything being split. Uh, all right, we're going to move on to the next one. We Thank are you, going to go back to Ryan to trace taste the Tres Sadji. I believe it's the 2015 that we're going to taste right now. 2013, 2015? What do you uh, have? 2013. Okay. One three. Yeah. 2013. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tres Sadji we have here. So if I'm not mistaken, it's actually meaning of three wise men. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. We like to think it's a religious experience when you drink this wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I was, I was actually told that actually the vineyard is surrounded by the three churches or the cathedral. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, again, this is a seven years old uh, Monte Picciano from Abruzzo. So, in terms of colors, you can see it's uh, moving to the garnet in color. It's garnet, it's no, no longer purplish or will be this is actually garnet so body wise you see looking at it uh, we still have about a medium plus body viscosity on the nose uh, i have a lot of uh, loads of actually sour plums sour cherries ripe prunes dark chocolate even a little bit of the red flower is actually more towards like the how tone kind of a red flowers to me In the mouth, you see, you can find it's still very jammy. It's very juicy, much of the reds and blue fruits. It's still pretty medium plus acidity. It's very refreshing. Tannin is there, but it's still very refined. You don't find that it's very uh, robust. It's very smooth. Hmm. Again, this is very well integrated. It's actually really showing the purity of the fruits. This is actually a, a very good Monte Puciano to me. They're actually showing the layer, different kind of, and also the ability to age at this moment. So in terms of food-wise, uh, for the local, for Malaysian, I would actually suggest we have uh, either the, the roast pork, mm, Chinese roast pork, or even the roast duck as well. We have the uh, something like Peking roast duck, and uh, even the Malays, actually, or the Indians, uh, kind of, uh, you have this, uh, we call it the tumbling soup. It's actually a, a lamb, or actually, I would say goat, made of a goat. So you have to actually marinate it, and then they make it into soup, which is uh, very full flavors and uh, slightly herby. But this, uh, they have a very juiciness and also uh, the ripeness of the, uh, from the grapes itself, and also the very high acidity that really can actually pierce through the all the very heavy the herbs in, in the soup itself. 
So this is one for the actually I, I always recommend to go with food. It's really nice. Yeah. Now, you know, Ryan, um, every time yeah. I taste this, uh, the, the 2013 vintage, I'm always a little bit concerned because 2013 was a very hot year. And obviously, mm -hmm. climatic conditions influence the flavor of a wine. And I'm always expecting, yeah. you know, a lot of roughness or a lot of cooked fruit. But actually, the freshness is still there. The coolness of, of the fruit is still there. And obviously, this comes from the cool nights, which obviously cooled down yeah. the grapes um, and, and, and the fact that the vineyards did not have any water stress or any lack yeah. of water. Um, for us, this is a, a, a single vineyard. So these are the best four hectares, as you know, that we produce on the vineyard. Um, and these are, again, 50-year-old vineyards. So for us, this is the greatest expression um, that we have of the Monte Pulciano grape, uh, which uh, I can guarantee all viewers uh, gets easier by the second glass to, uh, to pronounce, obviously. <laughs> Maybe second bottles to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. By the way, Rodrigo, it's a question I think for all the audience actually. Um, yes. Um, what is the major difference within the Tresaggi and the Moda? Because uh, mm -hmm. of course you already mentioned, but this is a single vineyard, and Moda actually offers, of course, it's actually coming I mean, blending from different vineyards. So yeah. maybe you can explain about the, the difference. Yeah, sure. Uh, so obviously, um, Tresaggi and Modau are different because uh, Tresaggi is a single vineyard. So a very specific block that year after year we know produces the best fruit. It's kind of like when you have, you know, that fruit tree you have in your backyard that knows that year after year produces the tastiest and the flavorist, uh, flavorist, most flavoring. Uh, anyway, the most tasty uh, fruit that you have. Uh, in any case, in, uh, in, uh, you know, in your backyard. And you know, in the same way, we know, or the people who work with us, who manage and take care, like children, uh, of their vineyards, know it's that plot that really makes uh, the ripest fruit. So first of all, it's a question of fruit, again. Uh, secondly, um, we obviously do longer macerations uh, to extract more color and more flavor. So obviously, the grapes are harvested a couple weeks later uh, from a specific block, with much longer maceration. So um, normally we will extract a lot wider a range and deeper range uh, of flavors because of this. And obviously the aging is different because the first red wine we tasted has uh, an aging of six months in large oak barrels. Um, and uh, the second wine, the Tresaggi we're tasting now, uh, is one year in small French oak barrels, uh, the ones that I have actually here in the back. So obviously the kind of wood uh, also imparts a different uh, a different flavor. Yep, got it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, we are almost out of time, but we're going to move on to our last wine here, which is Kudos, and we will be tasting with Fabien. Uh, and this is actually a more international wine, so it's fitting that we have someone from France to talk about these the blend in this unique wine. We're tasting the 13, I believe. So you 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 left a, a Frenchman to talk to me after all the criticisms I gave to the Frenchman? Uh, was exactly. that exactly? Hello, Rodrigo. Was Hello, Rodrigo. I... Hi, Fabien. <laughs> now I'm very embarrassed. <laughs> I know, but it's good. It's good that uh, you, you, you did it on purpose to tease me, and um, well, I'm here to tackle you back, don't worry. <laughs> Well, French are better at rugby, I have to say, than Italian, so you probably yeah, win. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's probably the only thing we are good at. Good. Well, um, hello, Rodrigo. Um, hello, everyone. Thank, thank you for having me uh, talking about uh, one of Talamonte wine. I hope I will not disappoint you, Rodrigo, but uh, I'll make sure uh, I will uh, get back to you uh, later on. Uh, so what I'm going to try is uh, Kudos Colline Pescari, Pescaresi 2013 Vintage. Um, it's uh, the top uh, cuvee, the flagship cuvee of uh, Talamonte. If I say anything wrong, Rodrigo, you you back me up. Huh? I will. Um, <laughs> so this is a 70% Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, 30% uh, Merlot. Uh, and actually, I have to say the with all you saying about the French, uh, the mellow helps a uh, kudos here to give a little bit of refinement. <laughs> I would have to agree with you there, absolutely. Okay, so um, let me talk through the, the wine. So it has a deep uh, red uh, garnet color showing some uh, purple hue. It's very intense, uh, beautiful viscosity, 
uh, quite high in concentration. So by the color, you're expecting something which will be rich, concentrated, and, and full-bodied. Uh, on the nose, uh, showing a little bit of development. It's a 2013 vintage. And uh, very focused on black fruits characters, so black around, blackberry, a bit of sweet to black cherry. Uh, I've got some... Um, a little bit of plums as well, some stewed compote, uh, compote, compote fruits, uh, some spices, some vanilla, a little bit of cloves due to the uh, aging oak. In, in a, it's it's big barrel, if I'm not wrong, uh, Rodrigo, it's 300 liters barrel, French barrel. Correct, yes. Um, so I've got a little bit of earthy notes as well. Um, it's a seven years old wine, so I've got uh, some very delicate earthy compounds such as uh, tobacco leaf, uh, some some dumb hairs, very, very elegant. And then uh, at the back of the nose, some very strong mineralities, like crushed uh, wet stone. So it's uh, on the nose only, it's a very complex wine, really, uh, really looking forward to, to tasting. On the palate, the, the wine is dry. It's a full bodied wine um, with obviously tannins are present, but they're very ripe, elegant. Quite velvety, I would say. Um, the oak is uh, is as well present. We're talking 14%, but very well integrated, very well balanced. Uh, you know, it's not over killing um, and and warming warming you over there. So it's very very well balanced. Acidity is fresh, uh, still uh, on the 2013. But I guess it was a great year 2013 as you produce kudos. Um, and then the the fruits here. Are, confirming on from the nose so a lot on black fruits a little bit more stewed i would say more uh, jammy compote flavors a little bit of prunes as well uh, and i've got some cinnamon touch which i didn't get on the nose so palette is really complex um with a, a quite a long complex complexity very long length um i mean it's a wine which obviously I will recommend to pair it with food, um, any kind of red meat, uh, you know, uh, T-bone, uh, ribeye. But if you if you're in Abruzzo, I guess you probably have a nice cannelloni with uh, with truffle. Maybe uh, if you're in Malta, I will recommend it with a local dish, which is rabbit. So a nice mm. ragu, uh, and ravioli with rabbit, um, aged cheeses. I mean, it's it's something that you want to to definitely enjoy with food. If you drink it on its own, uh, it's probably be you know uh, okay, but you might you might feel it uh, afterward. So overall, um, a superb wine. Uh, as I was saying, I think the mellow helps here to give a little bit of refinement and and some fruits flavor um, to the Montepulciano uh, and more uh, fruits fruits uh, fruit uh, notes. So yeah, I mean it's available here in Malta. And uh, it's available uh, pretty much uh, in all Asia as well, I assume. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you to the team. And um, I don't have any question, but if, uh, Rodrigo, you want to add anything. Uh, well, certainly. Yeah. I think I would love to rebut on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on your comment. Um, um, you know, um, Merlot has been around in Abruzzo for about 300 years, and I'll close it off on that. And so, obviously, in Italy, anything that's... Uh, not been around for at least a thousand years cannot be uh, considered indigenous. Now, obviously, uh, for us, uh, Merlot has been around for a long enough time to really be considered part of our uh, culture. Uh, what I will say is, um, without a doubt, uh, one of the characteristics we envy uh, uh, French wine producers is the youthfulness of their wines. And every time I travel to Bordeaux, or I travel to Burgundy uh, in, in wine regions that continue to teach us uh, uh, repeatedly uh, more, uh, like you know, any uh, reference point winemaking area, uh, is I'm always blown away by how in the winemaking, the French wine producers are able to preserve that youthfulness and that freshness in their wines. And this was the reason why we decided to blend Merlot to it, because we were looking aside from you know, the, the elegance or the refinement, uh, which we thought that Merlot would add, but really to try and give even more longevity uh, and even more freshness to, to our wines. Uh, because you go to France and you taste um, 
uh, you know, a 10 year old, 15 year old Grand Cru, and uh, you will uh, be blown away by how still young it, it, uh, it tastes. So this is the one thing that I envy in, uh, in French wine producers, if I would have to say it. <laughs> the one thing, the only thing. <laughs> one of, one of. The first one that comes to mind. Mm. Okay. Um, so we need to wrap it up pretty quick. I just have one question about the kudos. Sure. Is it, mm -hmm. um, do you always use the same proportions of Merlot and Montepulciano or does it change based on vintage? It, we are, we, it does change based on vintage. Um, not an enormous amount. I would say that we are working towards reducing the amount of uh, Merlot we utilize uh, as we learn to tackle the Montepulciano more and more. Um, there is no specific uh, uh, reason rather than trying to make a more, uh, um, um, I don't want to use the word authentic, but a more typical wine uh, from, this, uh, from this region. Because, uh, you know, just in Italy, we have 350 grape varieties. Um, if you can imagine that biodiversity I was talking to you at the, at the start of uh, the show, mm -hmm. that translates mm -hmm. obviously into grape varieties. Um, and so obviously the way to differentiate it is obviously to make something which tastes very typical and unique to your own area, which is uh, the experience we wish to give people. Cool. All right. And Salvatore is asking about the new labels. Rodrigo, could you tell us about the new labels? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I cannot show them to you yet, but um, <laughs> we have worked, obviously, on a complete uh, restyling of uh, the labels. So, um, obviously, the wines that we have tasted today are the labels that are available um, within uh, your marketplaces. This is the wine that is currently uh, in the different stores of where you are. Um, but uh, over the next year, uh, we will be um, uh, shifting to completely the Burgundy bottle, for example, which in Italy uh, has an implication of more prestige uh, and uh, more premium identity. And today we know that obviously uh, uh, image and, uh, and packaging is very important. And obviously we're trying to uh, emphasize uh, outside what already people know is found inside. Mm-hmm. Great. So, well, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. And it's uh, great to be it's here. interesting to see what the new what the new packaging looks like. I like seeing rebrands and redesigns. Um, do we have any other questions that we can go through quickly here? I think we answered a lot of them already. Um, we did have one person. We have about two and a half minutes left. But one person asked if you do any collaborations with any Japanese winemakers. Uh, we don't. I would, uh, you know, it'd be something we'd be interested. I'm a big fan uh, about Asian uh, culture, traditions, and, and, and philosophies in, in general. And uh, every trip to Japan has been uh, eye opening. Um, we don't yet do that, uh, but, you know, never say never. We take a lot of interns uh, at the winery, and uh, sometimes. Uh, they come from different parts of the world. So uh, we would love to, you know, if there's anybody out there who's living in Japan and is willing to uh, face, you know, the quarantine realities of today and uh, wishes to uh, come over and uh, spend uh, a season at our winery, we'd love to, you know, receive their CV. Um, as far as the winemakers that work with us, you know, they're 100% bred and raised uh, uh, Italian. That's, uh, that's uh, so far what, uh, what, what we've done. So, yeah, absolutely. Great experience. So I did yeah. that in New Zealand and in the U.S. and to be able to go to different regions and explore and then bring it back to where you are is it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I, yeah. yeah I, I might add that we actually learn also very much from the interns that come. So for us, it's just as much a, an eye opening experience. Great. All right. Well, that's that's basically all the time that we have. We've come right down to the wire. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us. Um, Ryan, Grazie. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. 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 Salute. Salute.